So now that we've calculated the effects and sums of squares by hand, let me show you how to do it in junk. So even though this is repeated measures, whereas last week we were doing um, independent groups, the good news is that the two-way ANOVA is basically the same. So this will be a reminder of how to do a two-way ANOVA in jump and also kind of a detailed review of the output. So I've got my finger tap data here. Um, first of all, notice the format that it's in. So it's not in what we would call wide format where you have one participant per row and three different measurements for them. Instead, it's in a long format. So each participant is taking up three rows because they each tried three different stimulants. And then each of the observations is labeled based on the stimulant and the participant. So I'm going to do analyze fit model because I do have two explanatory variables here, the stimulant but also participant that I'm using as the block effect. And I'm going to put my response variable into the Y, so that'll be the number of taps. And then stimulant and participant, I'm going to add both of those to the construct model effects box. One thing that is different is that I can't do an interaction term here, and I'll talk about that a little later. So I'll click run. And we scroll down and see all of the output here. And we're going to go through this one at a time. We're also going to talk about the parameter estimates. So I'll go ahead and open that up. So let's start with R squared. So this means the same thing it meant at the beginning of the semester. This is how much variability is explained. So this is telling us that 95% of the variation in the response variable, which in this case is tapping rates, 95% of the variation in tapping rates is explained by the model. And in this case, we're talking about the overall model. So we're talking about the model using both stimulant and participant, because we took both of those into account here. And if you wanted to see how to calculate that 95% using the sums of squares, you would use these numbers here because they refer to the overall model. So the amount of variability explained is that 6,350. Out of the total variability is 6,682. And when you divide that, you get 0.95. So that's where the R squared comes from. So this whole section here, this analysis of variance section, um, describes the overall model. So this is the variability explained by both of your explanatory variables. And if you wanted to think about what this is testing, what this f-test is for, basically the null hypothesis would be that none of your variables are associated with the response. So this would be no treatment or block effects. So nothing in the model is useful. That would be the null hypothesis. And we've got strong evidence that that's not the case, that at least one um, of these explanatory variables is associated with the response. So just based on the analysis of variance table, you can't even tell which one, treatment or block or both. The next table, the parameter estimates, this has the effects that we calculated before by hand. So these are our effects. And notice that some of them are missing, and the reason that they don't list them all is because the effects do sum to zero. So like the fact that we have an effect of seven for theobromine and five for caffeine, that's 12. And so that means we have to have negative 12 for the placebo because it has to sum to zero. And then for the participants, same sort of thing. Got negative 17 minus 15 minus four, and that comes out to be negative 36. So we know that it has to be positive 36 for participant four. You can also think about the number of effects that are listed here as reflecting the degrees of freedom. So for stimulant, we only actually had to list two and we could figure out the third one. So there's only two degrees of freedom for stimulant. For participant, we only actually had to list three and we could figure out the fourth one. So there's three degrees of freedom for participant. The effect test here are for the explanatory variables separately. So like this would be the F test for stimulant and we already discussed that one earlier in the notes. And this one would be the F test for blocks. So the um, null hypothesis would be that there's no block effect, um, and the alternative is that at least one of the participants is different from the others, same as like what we did for stimulant. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all different, um, but it does seem like overall blocks is helpful for explaining the variability.
This part of the output is also helpful because it helps us divide up the variation explained. So we said the total amount of variation explained was 95%. And we can break that up into the part that's explained by stimulant. So stimulant, the sum of squares was 872. And the total from the analysis of variance table is 6,682. And so that's telling us that 13% of the variability is being explained by stimulant. And then we can do the same sort of thing for blocks or the participants. So we've got the sum of squares for participants was 5,478 out of the total 6,682, and that was 82%. And 13 plus 82 is 95%. So this is sort of showing you how it breaks down. So I mentioned earlier that we shouldn't include an interaction term. Let's see what happens when we try to do that. So I'm going to do analyze fit model and I'm going to put tabs here and let's say I wanted to just do it like a full factorial so I highlighted them both I clicked macros and then did full factorial you can also do the two effects separately and then do the cross that's another option okay so I'm gonna click run this is what I would do if I were doing like a regular full factorial two-way ANOVA and it really freaks out so the R squared is 1, 100% of the variability explained. And if you look at the parameter estimates, we have a whole bunch of interaction effects here. So the problem is that we've run out of degrees of freedom. Our sample size was only 12, so our total degrees of freedom was 12 minus 1 equals 11. And we've used two of them for stimulant. We've used three degrees of freedom for participant and we've used five for the interaction effect. So if you were to use this prediction equation to try to predict for each um, participant and stimulant, you would reproduce the data perfectly. But that's not really telling you anything. It's not telling you that your model is good because it's always going to be this way. If you run out of degrees of freedom, it'll reproduce your data perfectly. You'll have an R squared of one, but you have no idea how well the model actually fits. So the problem is that there's only one observation for each stimulant participant combination, and so we just don't have enough degrees of freedom. The key thing to remember is that we can't test for an interaction unless the study has replication. So replication means that for each combination of your explanatory variables, you have multiple observations. In this case, there aren't enough degrees of freedom, and so without replication, we cannot test for interaction. So the bad thing about this is that we're sort of forced to use an additive model. An additive model just means that it doesn't have an interaction term. And with an additive model, remember, you're making that big assumption. It assumes that there's no interaction. So here we're assuming that the effect of each stimulant is the same for all of our participants, which may or may not be true, but that's sort of the only modeling option we have. If we wanted to allow for the possibility of an interaction, we would have to have each participant try every stimulant more than once.